presentation on what is synesthesia and the interest it aroused in certain circles of artists in the 19th century. So whenever I give talks about synesthesia, there are always two questions that come up in the beginning, and that is what is synesthesia? And also, how do you pronounce <laughs> synesthesia? So synesthesia might remind us of a more familiar word, anesthesia. And as we know, anesthesia means no sensation. Synesthesia means joined sensation. So basic definition of synesthesia is that one of the five senses is stimulated, but more than one responds. So what makes this happen? Well, it's just a kind of neurological anomaly experienced by maybe up to 3% of the population. And there are many different forms of synesthesia. There are many different ways that the senses can overlap and combine. Um, just to give you one example, there is music color synesthesia. So for people who experience this form of synesthesia, and probably it's maybe less than 1%, people who experience this form of synesthesia, they hear music, but they don't only hear the music, they also see the music. So the music might evoke colors and shapes for them that they would kind of see in their mind's eye, although when I was writing my book, I interviewed a lot of synesthetes, and some of them would actually report perceiving uh, these music-induced colors and shapes in external space as well. And so a very, this is prop, and by the way, I should, I should explain that this is an absolutely automatic reaction. The person does not do anything to make this happen. It's not an exercise of the imagination where you listen to music and you think, oh, if I were going to think of the music in terms of color, what would the colors be? No, it's absolutely automatic. So um, a very prominent synesthete that I'm sure many of, many of us have, <laughs> have heard of is the composer Olivier Messiaen. And uh, he, for many years, very, very innovative composer, uh, for many years, he was professor at the Paris Conservatory of Music, and he has talked, he described his experience of colored and also textured music. And we can even see by the titles of some of his compositions, um, the influence of color in, in his experience of music, Les Coulures de la Cité Céleste, Chronochromie. So Messiaen described perceiving the upper range of C-sharp as the color of rock crystal and citrine. The lower range is copper with gold highlights. D flat is orange with stripes of pale yellow, red, and gold, while the inversion of D flat moves through pale green, amethyst, and black. So very often a music color synesthete will perceive different notes, musical notes and musical keys as having very, very specific colors. Another very common form of synesthesia, perhaps even more common than music color synesthesia, is colored word synesthesia. So uh, this is probably experienced by maybe between one and 1.5% of the population. Okay. Um, no. They perceive words in color, even alphabet letters, no. numbers in color. Um, I experienced this form of synesthesia. People often ask me, well, you know, the the colors that you perceive, are they the same as the colors that other people with this form of synesthesia perceive? So I would say in general, no. Um, the experience tends to be very idiosyncratic. Here we have, uh, we have the colored alphabets of two synesthetes. Mine is on the left, uh, Carol Steen, another synesthete. Um, with me, she's the co-founder of the American Synesthesia Association. We have conferences and so on on synesthesia uh, is, is on the right. And you can see that in most cases, the colors are quite different. There are some mysterious commonalities in this form of synesthesia um, that no one can explain. For some reason, the, the vowels, I, O, and U, something like 92% of synesthetes with this form of synesthesia will perceive in the same color range. And so far, no one is quite sure why. So um, there are many, many different forms of synesthesia. 
Um, and you know, experiences of synesthesia have been reported for probably centuries, but there were two times in history when synesthesia received a lot of attention, not only from the artistic community, but also from the scientific community. But usually the scientific community interest began with interest from the artistic community. So it began in uh, the mid 19th century uh, with the, this poem, which I'm sure you know, by Baudelaire, Correspondance. So maybe someone who can read French poetry better than I can would like to read this verse aloud. Would anyone like to do that? Um, right. Oui. Correspondance. Comme de longs échos qui de loin se confondent dans une ténébreuse et profonde unité, vaste comme la nuit et comme la clarté, les parfums, les couleurs et les sons se répondent. Merci, Gonzalo. OK, beautiful. All right, so I'll read it very quickly in English. Like long echoes that mingle from afar in a dark and profound unity, vast like the night and the light, perfumes, colors, and sounds correspond. So the poem describes a kind of unity of the, of the senses. It, it almost goes beyond that and hints at a kind of hidden unity in the universe. And this was a very attractive idea among poets and artists at this, at this time in history. Why? Well, let's think of what was going on at that time. We had the Industrial Revolution ushering in a very different way of life. People were moving from farm to factory, suddenly, you know, long hours in the factory away from family, friends, neighbors, away from any sense of community, experience a kind of, kind of fragmentation and, and isolation that had not been experienced before. And certain circles of artists were really very worried about the dehumanizing effects that this new way of life was going to have. And they saw art and poetry as a way to kind of restore um, the belief and, you know, and the understanding of full human potential and, and perhaps even expand human consciousness and, and a, almost a kind of tool for expanding human consciousness. And another tool that was discovered to expand human consciousness at this time was hashish. So ha hashish was relatively new in, in France at the time. It had been discovered it, perhaps about 50 years earlier uh, when Napoleon's army invaded Egypt, was brought, the French soldiers discovered hashish, was brought back to France, and some decades later began to make its way into, you know, certain circles of artists. And the hashish club was formed, or le club des hachichiens, and we can see, I hope you can see the, the names on this picture. We see that the Hashish Club had some very illustrious members. Baudelaire was a member. Uh, the great uh, novelist Alexandre Dumas was a member. The painter Delacroix, uh, Balzac, Hugo were all members of the Hashish Club. So they were quite fascinated with the effects of Hashish and you know, the kind of altered consciousness that it produced. The Hashish Club met once a month under the direction of a medical doctor, Dr. Jean-Jacques Moreau, who wanted to study the effects of Hashish on the nervous system. And so he encouraged these writers and artists to write about their experiences under Hashish, and it led to Baudelaire writing Artificial Paradises. And here we have a, a little excerpt, sound holds color, color holds music, musical notes become numbers. So again, you know, here we see a kind of, a kind of hashish-induced synesthesia, um, blending of, of, of sense perceptions. And also a, a member of the hashish club was uh, Gautier, the, the poet, and he also writes about his, his experiences of, of sensory blending. I heard the clamor of colors, green, red, yellow came to me in distinct waves. So by about 1849, um, I should mention that, you know, the Hashish Club met once a month at, uh, at the time it was called the Hotel Pimadon. Uh, 
It still stands in Paris. It's now called the Hotel de Lausanne. And uh, Dr. Moreau, the medical doctor, would serve hashish-laced coffee uh, to all of the members. So by 1849, the, the hashish club disbanded. Dr. Moreau felt that he'd gathered enough data for his research. And at the end of that time, Baudelaire said that he'd had enough of hashish for the rest of his life, and he'd much rather enjoy a good, a good glass of wine with friends. So some years later, um, probably early 1870s, we had the young poet Arthur Rimbaud coming on the scene, coming to Paris, very much admiring the older generation um, of poets, of, of Baudelaire and his circle. Uh, Rambo, as we know, also experimented with hashish, with opium, and he really, he liked reading medical encyclopedias to find some reference, some explanation for some of the, you know, very unusual experiences that he had uh, under hashish. And in reading the medical encyclopedia, he was also very amazed to discover that there was a documented condition of people who regularly experienced uh, sounds and colors as blending, had, you know, this kind of blended sensory experience without taking any drugs at all. And he very much romanticized that condition. At the time, it was not called synesthesia. That term was coined later. It was called chromosthesia, which means color sensation. Um, also uh, in uh, audition coloré or colored hearing. And uh, Rambeau is quite fascinated by this. And he wrote a poem trying to almost project himself into the state of consciousness of someone who experienced this, um, colored vowels, colored sounds. And he wrote voyelle, or in English, uh, it's called Sonnet of the Vowels. All right, so um, Rambeau very much identified uh, synesthesia or chromesthesia, blended sensory perceptions with the kind of mystical consciousness. He almost felt that this was, you know, a next step in the evolution of human consciousness. And he, he was very fascinated by people who experienced this naturally. And uh, by the way, after Voyelle was published, it had a huge impact, not only on the artistic community, but also on the scientific community. The year after Voyelle came out, 16 scientific papers were published on synesthesia or audition coloré. Uh, before that, there was really very little interest, it, although this was a documented condition. You know, most doctors did not know about it, were not very interested in it. But somehow Rambeau's poem brought a lot of attention to this and brought up the question, what does it mean that people can have such very different perceptions of reality? So at the 1889 Conference on Physiological Psychology in Paris, colored hearing was the most popular topic. And again, you know, poets in Rambeau's circle, uh, called symbolist poets, revered those capable of natural colored hearing. And by the mid uh, 1880s, the two topics talked about in nearly every Paris and Berlin salon were Wagner and the unconscious, audition coloré, especially Rambeau's poetic treatment of the subject. Um, by the way, this quote is from a very good book on, on the history of synesthesia called Bright Colors Falsely Seen. Also, uh, you know, at the forefront of uh, uh, Rimbaud's uh, circle was the writer René Gilles, who wrote Traité du Verbe about, uh, about colored hearing. And I think we can see from this quote, you know, there was a kind of excitement in the artistic community that the scientific community was taking this seriously, was taking a serious look at this and, and wanting to you know, do research on this. And so, as he says, now undeniably scientific review gives validity to the miraculous fact of colored hearing, which points to that distant time we humbly await where all the arts in their unconscious irreverence 
will return and lose themselves in a total communion. In my estimation, this is most certainly a phase in the evolution of our higher senses. So again, you know, there was this identification of, um, of the experience of blended perceptions with somehow, you know, the, the next step in human consciousness, in, in human evolution. However, not everybody, not everybody at the time took such a lofty view of synesthesia. Um, here we have the art critic Max Nordo, a German art critic, and in his book, Degeneration, he writes, to raise the combination and confusion of sight and sound to the rank of a principle of art, to see futurity in this principle, is to designate as progress the return of the consciousness of man to that of an oyster. <laughs> okay, so taking a much more objective view was the psychologist uh, Flo Noir, who said, you know, he viewed colored hearing simply as a human trait, an unusual human trait. As he said, possessing neither excess of honor nor indignity. So he said, we don't need to glorify this trait. We don't need to denigrate this trait. We just need to study it and try to understand it better. So all of the interest uh, in, in synesthesia in artistic circles spilled over into the 20th century. And we can find some depictions um, of synesthetic experience in works of fiction. For example, here we have one in, in, in uh, Proust's In Search of Lost Time. The name Guermant was always suffused with an orange tint. The name of Parma, one of the towns that I most long to visit, seeming to be compact and glossy, violent, violet tinted, soft. You may know that the great fiction writer of the, another great fiction writer of the 20th century, Vladimir Nabokov, also experienced uh, uh, synesthesia, colored word synesthesia. He has actually quite a beautiful description of his colored alphabet in his autobiography, Speak Memory. So um, it goes on for quite a bit. I'm just going to read maybe the first line. I present a fine case of colored hearing. A French ah evokes polished ebony. The black group also includes hard G, vulcanized rubber, and R, a sooty rag being ripped. Oatmeal N, noodle limp L, and the ivory-backed hand mirror of O take care of the whites. And it goes on. Um, another, he also had some synesthetic characters in his novels. Now this, this uh, autobiography is very interesting. It has a description of synesthetic experience I would not have expected necessarily to find it in this autobiography. It's, uh, it is the autobiography of Jacques Lucéron, who was uh, a leader of the French resistance in the Second World War. Uh, he was blind and in his autobiography, and then there was light, he describes the color music synesthesia that developed after he lost his sight at the age of eight. So let's just take a look at this. At concerts, for me, the orchestra was like a painter. It flooded me with all the colors of the rainbow. If the violin came by itself, I was suddenly filled with gold and fire, with red so bright that I could not remember having seen it on any object. When it was the oboe's turn, a clear green ran all through me, so cool that I seemed to feel the breath of night. I visited the land of music. So what I find so interesting about this description too is that it, it also describes, a, in, in addition to the color experience, it describes a kind of spatial quality. I visited the land of music. It's almost, almost like music is an environment. And I think we find this, this sense of a spatial quality in, um, in other descriptions of synesthetic experience as well. So lest we think it was only 19th and 20th century European, writers that uh, talked about their synesthesia. Here we have an example of a 14th century Chinese poet, Chang Yu. And let's take a look. Brilliant, bright flowers of the cold season, their subtle fragrance arises in the quiet. Others are hoping to smell them a few times, but I prefer to use my, oh, sorry. I prefer to use my ears. The fragrance sends forth jewel-like songs. Singing them out loud, I feel such joy. And who says there is no fragrance in sound? 
smelling and hearing are really the same thing. So interestingly, there is a contemporary Chinese painter, Ning Wei Xiang, who is a synesthete. Um, he experiences music and also the rhythms, uh, the sounds of music, but also the rhythms of music and poetry is having colors and shapes. And so he has done a painting in homage to, uh, to Chang Yu. Now, Ning Wei Xiang met the, the, the painter Timothy Layden from the UK, who is also a synesthete painter, um, introduced him to the music of the Tang Dynasty, and Timothy Layden made this painting. This is what the music made him experience visually. In contemporary Paris, in our own day, uh, we have the artist Sophie Scheer, and uh, she has a very interesting form of synesthesia where kind of the shapes move a sense of colored moving shapes in her mind's eye that she then paints evoke a kind of music for her. So it's almost a kind of synesthesia in the other direction from, from the, the previous cases we've been talking about. Um, I find her work very beautiful. She has shown her work at a number of galleries in Paris, other places in France. If you'd like to see more of her work, if you just Google Sophie Scheer, a painter, you will get her website with, with a lot of her works. You may know that David Hockney, uh, the contemporary artist, experiences music color synesthesia. And at one, at one time, he painted stage sets for the Metropolitan Opera. And we sometimes could find these very unusual color effects. Like in this case, we have red tree trunks and blue leaves because those were the colors he was hearing in the opera music. Uh, Hélène, oh, I'm sorry, Hélène Grimaud, the, the pianist, has talked about her experience of synesthesia. So as we see here, an F sharp is red, C minor is blue, G major is green, and B flat is yellow, explains Grimaud, who has a condition called synesthesia. Um, yeah, she is, she is such an amazing, amazing musician, amazing human being. Uh, in our contemporary days here in the U.S., Pharrell Williams, who, you know, kind of a pop musician who has won 13 Grammy Awards, um, has talked about his experience, including Happy, which is maybe the most known one, um, has talked about how his color music synesthesia figures into uh, his creating, his compositions. And in the world of theater, uh, the legendary theater director, Peter Brook, and his creative partner, Marie-Hélène Etienne, staged a play about synesthesia and a synesthete called The Valley of Astonishment. It was shown at the Bouffe du Nord uh, Theater in Paris in 2014. It then went to theaters around the world. It, it also showed in New York at Theater for a New Audience. Um, I had the amazing experience of meeting um, Peter Brook and uh, Marie-Hélène Etienne when they were in New York to do research for their uh, play. They wanted to meet people who experienced synesthesia. Um, the actors in Valley of Astonishment uh, were all asked to read my book, Blue Cats, which is about uh, synesthetic experience. So just to review a little bit, um, it's very interesting to me that synesthesia has always existed at the crossroads of science and art. Uh, in the 1880s, it was Rambo's poem that, that sparked the interest of the scientific community, led to scientific research on synesthesia. And a hundred years later, in the 1980s, it was a painting by a UK painter, Elizabeth St Stewart Jones, which piqued the interest of scientists. So in 1986, UK artist Elizabeth Stewart Jones wrote a letter to a journal, The Psychologist, describing her lifelong perception of words and sounds having color and asking scientists what caused these experiences. And Dr. Simon Baron Cohen, then of the Institute of Psychiatry in London, later of Cambridge University, took up the challenge. He organized a series of brain imaging studies and he found that something unusual really was happening in the brains of synesthetes, that there was very unusual cross-activation 
between different parts of the brain that you wouldn't necessarily expect to communicate with each other. For example, in the case of colored word synesthetes, the part of the brain controlling uh, language processing had some unusual uh, active cross activation with the part of the brain controlling color perception, almost as if the, the synesthetes were experiencing the words as colorful objects. So now universities all around the world are studying synesthesia, kind of eager to know uh, the mysteries it may yield about the workings of the human brain. And uh, there have been articles about synesthesia in the popular press. Some of them have uh, inspired uh, fiction writers to create characters who are synesthetes in their novels, including uh, Salman Rushdie and, uh, well, Nabokov, of course, did it a long time ago. Um, uh, Monique Trung, uh, Jason Matthews, Red Sparrow, which became a movie, though unfortunately the, the character's synesthesia did not get into the movie, though it's actually a, quite a major part of the book. So we know that, you know, in languages all over the world, we have, we have synesthetic metaphor in poetry. For example, just to take one example for now, um, the U.S. poet Hart Crane uh, wrote a wonderful poem, The Royal Palm, describing palm tree, a po beautiful palm tree as that tower of whispered light. So we have a sound image put together with a visual image and even in our everyday language, uh, our everyday language is full of synesthetic metaphor. Um, he's always wearing such loud colors. He wears hot pink when he should wear cool gray. It can be bitter cold in New York in winter. So all of us understand these metaphors. Uh, we have no trouble um, whether or not we are neurological synesthetes. So why is that? Well, according to Dr. Lawrence Marks of Yale University, it's because we are all synesthetes to some degree. We are all on a synesthesia continuum from mild to strong. So at the mild end of the continuum, we have a kind of metaphorical understanding of, of synesthesia, of how the senses can combine. As you get to the stronger end of the synesthesia spectrum, the experience becomes more idiosyncratic, more literal, quirkier, <laughs> but we are, it all sort of refers to the same phenomenon. So synesthesia opens a door to exploring the diverse forms that knowledge can take on our inner maps. Um, and just as in recent decades, we've come to have a better understanding and appreciation of our cultural and ethnic diversity, synesthesia opens a door to exploring and celebrating our neural diversity. And again, um, very interesting to me that synesthesia studies has always been at the crossroads of art and science. Uh, again, uh, it was uh, Rambeau's poem that sparked interest in the scientific community in the 19th century, Elizabeth Stewart Jones' painting that sparked interest in the late uh, 20th century, the 1980s. So the presence and the influence of Rambeau remains. So thank you, merci. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Pat. Bravo, bravo. Uh, if anyone uh, has any questions. Uh, I have a question. For Pat, yes. Uh, yeah. So, okay. um, Pat, Pat, apart, 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 apart from, from those who are uh, not purposefully synesthetic, more like individuals like yourself who are ne neurologically synesthetic, um, would that be uh, displayed by a conflation of more than two senses, could it be? Um, or is that a rare thing? Or is it just usually a conflation of two? Well, there are people that, uh, it's usually a conflation of two. However, there are people that experience multiple forms of synesthesia. Um, you know, At the there same are, time. Uh, well, for example, there are people that experience music, color synesthesia. There are even people that experience every word as having a taste. Um, I just interviewed a, a word taste synesthete. So I would say that the, you know, that, that each form of synesthes synesthesia is a conflation of two senses, but mm -hmm. that within one individual, 
the one mm -hmm. individual might experience, you know, several of, of those forms of synesthesia. And Someone might have music color, mm -hmm. word color, you know, mm -hmm. word taste, and so on. And for you personally, um, when you experience these synesthetic moments, are they consistent? In other words, do you Very always consistent. see you always see the same color as the same letter or right. the same whatever? It never changes, and that and that's actually one of the hallmarks of. A synesthetic experience is that it's generally a you know a, a, a very if we're talking about neurological synesthesia yes that's about drug induced synesthesia no, that, that's, that could that's, go anywhere exactly but that's um, poetic <laughs> exactly All yeah purposeful. But, uh, neurological synesthesia is generally very consistent you know if the letter a is orange it's always orange <laughs> that's uh -huh. it but, 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 but in that respect can I ask you a question uh, does it matter if the letter, like when you read a book, for example, it's usually in black and white. Right. So you will see the vowel as having a color on the page, right? Does it matter? Yeah, this is a hard thing to explain, but I, for example, if I read a standard book, right, that has black print, I, of course, I know the print is black, but at the same time, um, it's hard to explain how, how, how I perceive this, but at the same time, my own colors are there. But, but does it matter, for example, if the title were in red, for example, would it affect your perception no, of color? That doesn't affect it. What's very um, irritating is if I, is if someone uh, writes a text and, and the letters are in different colors and they don't match mine. It's also, just, also, it's just so, annoying. <laughs> it's just, you know, you just have this sort of like automatic reaction like, why are they writing it in all the wrong colors? Like, for example, the Toys are Us sign. I don't know if everybody remembers that. Um, yeah, it's multicolored. All the, all the colors were wrong, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Exactly. So it was just an irritating <laughs> experience. But I was able to, you know, to read it. So yeah. what's, the, what's the most unusual form of synesthesia that you've heard oh. of or read about or experienced? Oh, that's that's a really, really interesting question. Um, well, one form of synesthesia that I that I have heard about. In fact, there's a whole book about it. It's, mm -hmm. it's called The Man Who Tasted Shapes. And mm -hmm. uh, for this particular person, every taste evoked the feeling of a particular shape in the mm -hmm. palm of his hand. And so it was discovered that the, a neurologist wrote the book and he discovered that his friend had this form of synesthesia. The friend had a dinner party invited everyone to the dinner party and, and apologized because he said, I wanted the chicken to be more pointy, but it came out too round. And of course, <laughs> nobody knew. Who, everybody <laughs> thought, well, you know, he's yeah. kind of very imaginative. This is probably his imaginative way of, but, but his neurologist friend said, hmm, I wonder what's going on here. And, uh, you know, interviewed him very seriously and, and did some study and found that, no, actually, he's experiencing this form of synesthesia, where tastes evoke the, the, the sensation of a shape in the palm of his hand. Are so you that's suggesting, a pretty unusual form. Are you suggesting that this individual was not aware of these things before? Well, you know, it's, you know, it's hard to explain. People often say to me, Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you see words in color. I mean, wasn't that, uh, isn't that something like very strange that you talked about as a child? But, you know, you don't because it's so much, it's so much a part and parcel of your everyday experience. In fact, I thought everybody experienced um, words as having color until I was about 16 years old. And I, and from mm -hmm. interviewing people with synesthesia, I find that this is something very common that whatever form of synesthesia people have, they, they, they assume other people are experiencing that too. And we don't usually get a chance to talk about these things. I mean, just to give you a kind of analogy, um, you know, we, we all see the letters as particular shapes, but it never occurs to any of us to say, you know, when I see an O, I see a circle. Is that what you see? You kind of just assume that's what other people are seeing. So really? just as... Huh. Yeah, so I also, I just made the assumption that everybody, you know, also saw the colors. I never even gave it a thought until mm -hmm. one day I said something kind of by, you know, I was having a conversation with my father and we were both, rem I was 16, we were both remembering that he was teaching me to write alphabet letters when I was a little girl. Mm -hmm. 
and we both remembered I had trouble making the letter R. So during this conversation, I said to my father, but then one day I realized that to make an R, I just had to draw P and then draw another line down from the loop. And I was so surprised I could turn a yellow letter into an orange letter just by adding a line. And my father said, what? <laughs> a yellow letter, an orange letter, what do you mean? And this was the first time that I realized that you know, I was having an experience that most other people were not. And I think that's how it is for most people with synesthesia. So, uh, 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 Matt, excuse me, excuse me. Yes. Uh, uh, Francis has a question, and, and then after that, Robert has a question. And oh, okay. Then we're gonna Sorry. Finish, and then we're going to finish up the, uh, the remarks because it's already 6.44, and uh, we'll get to 6.44. Yeah. Um, okay. can, can, can you hear me? Francis, yes, yes, yes of yes. course. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I don't have a question. I just want to say uh, thank you very much, Pat. Your presentation was green. And <laughs> all the words, uh, it linked a little bit to the red. And for that, we really love you. We love you and we thank you. Thank you, you Francis. I want, I want a, a precise drawing of it <laughs> you. by next week. Thank you. Merci. This is uh, so fascinating. I could come up with a zillion questions. One of them you've alluded to in the term, in your terms of people not realizing they have this condition until they realize that it's different. They're different from other people. Right. Once the research is done, mm -hmm. it become clear that those who have it have it from birth, or does it develop, or can it be developed? Can one can one become a, a synesthete, or whatever it's called? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, well, to, to take the first part of your question, uh, I think people who have it, you know, they have, they have this experience, most of them will say ever since they can remember. I know that when I was a child, before I knew, how, before I learned how to read or write, each word that I heard evoked a kind of colorful uh, design in my mind's eye, like something like a kind of kaleidoscopic pattern. And I think what happened is when I went to school, and when you go to school, you learn the alphabet, you learn a shared visual system for representing language. And I think that began to replace my designs, but maybe I took some features with me. I took some of the colors with me. And from talking to um, researchers uh, who are studying synesthesia in young children and in their language development, this seems to be how it, how it works. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, there seems to be a genetic component to synesthesia. There's uh -huh. actually a lot of research going on now, uh, with, uh, Cambridge university, other universities, um, about the genetics of synesthesia. So and are you saying it's from by, by dint of effort? Can one Sorry? this as a, by dint of... Well, there is, there is a scientist at University of Sussex who says that he has successfully, uh, taught a group of people to be colored word synesthetes. Uh, that he had them, you know, reading every day, reading, um, reading texts uh, in, in where, where all of the letters were in colors, you know, you know, very consistent colors. And that after nine weeks of this, they began sort of, you know, experiencing these colors on their own, even when they read black and white texts. I guess the difference is it didn't last. You know, after the, you know, a couple of, maybe a couple of months after the training was over, they sort of forgot, you know, what those colors were and where for uh, someone who has what's called constitutional synesthesia or neurological synesthesia, it, you never, you, you can't forget it. It's just they were, they were, there. They were imitating a described phenomenon, sounds like. I the, guess so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, have, we have one last uh, question from Marceline who sent it in and she asked, does syn synesthesia ever happen after an accident or a trauma? Such yes, a yes. This is another, this is, a, this is a kind of what's called acquired synesthesia. So absolutely, but it would be a different, it would take a different form. Um, sounds might take on random colors. It wouldn't have the, the consistency that neurological synesthesia has, but, at, but she's absolutely right. Yes, okay. that can happen.
thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you for oh, answering. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you so much. This presentation, it was excellent. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Wonderful. It's very kind. Thank topic. you so much. Very enlightening. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Bye.